Our guest this weekend is Dr. Guido Halsman, a senior fellow here at the Mises Institute and a professor of economics at the University of Angers in France. And while Guido teaches in France, he's originally from Germany. So we thought we'd ask him about immigration and the ongoing migrant crisis in Europe from the perspective of Mises, Rothbard, and Hoppe. We talk about the critical distinction between nation and state, about who actually owns so-called public property and ought to control it, and whether the concept of open borders is actually a big government statist construct. Stay tuned for a great interview with Dr. Guido Holzman. So, Dr. Holzman, good morning, and thanks so much for being with us. It's my pleasure to be with you here. And welcome back to Auburn. We're looking forward to your talk later today. Yeah, it's always good to come back to my academic home. Since you're here and you're in Auburn, we thought we would talk about an issue that's very much in the in the Western media and especially in the U.S. press, the issue of immigration and a migration crisis in Europe. You're German, but you live and work in France. Right. Uh, can you tell us personally any changes you've seen over the last five years or two years in terms of, of the effect of immigrants in either one of those countries? In uh, France, uh, in, in my own, uh, in the town where I live, in, in Angers, so there has been a significant immigration in the, in the past uh, five years, I would say, in particular. Uh, when I arrived in 2004, there was hardly, the, I mean, Angers was a typical uh, traditional French uh, city with a very low um, well, uh, immigrant uh, population uh, uh, in, in the city, about 10% or, or less. And that has increased, I would say today, it's probably we're closer to 15 or 20%. So it's not an extreme change, but I mean, it's a significant change, in particular because uh, we, we got uh, lots of immigrants two or three years ago from Africa. So they st- uh, stick out more than the other because you can identify them by skin uh, color. So you, 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 you sense to a greater extent there's this uh, wave of, of, of new arrivals. Uh, in Germany, um, uh, we have, we've seen this in the news, uh, the changes have been uh, more dramatic, uh, especially last year. Uh, no uh, similar thing happened in France. So it's uh, really a phenomenon that was limited to Germany, uh, Austria to some extent, and also Sweden and, and Denmark. And I have not witnessed this uh, personally because uh, I, I didn't uh, travel to Germany in the past six months. But I will go there actually next week. So I, <laughs> if we do another interview <laughs> at the end of the month, I can I can give you my my first and impressions. Well, you've studied the work of Mises to to a lar- to a great extent. You're a biographer of Mises. In in a later edition of Human Action, he talked about the potential need for migration barriers to. Uh, protect against an aggressor in, in let's say, in wartime. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Mises' view of human migration and, and what he would think of things today? Well, uh, human, uh, uh, Mises was a liberal in, in the classical sense of the word, so he was opposed to government interventions. And what governments do is, uh, well, I mean, they, they can actually uh, uh, slow down artificially, forceful by, by compulsion and coercion, the flow of, of, of migrants. So out of a country and into, uh, into a country, out of a country, we've seen this in the case of the Soviet bloc, uh, where the governments prevented their people from leaving. And then also uh, immigration into a country where governments imposing uh, limits, uh, for example, uh, was a traditional policy uh, in the United States uh, in the 19th century and uh, also until uh, fairly recent times uh, in the in the uh, 20th century and also in countries such as Australia, New Zealand and so on. Uh, where there were always uh, some uh, government control on immigration flows. Um, uh, so the, uh, uh, this being said, um, you know, what uh, uh, needs to be added uh, right away is that, of course, government cannot only um, uh, slow down uh, immigration uh, artificially, so through violence, but they can also uh, enforce in, uh, inflation artificially through violence. And this is uh, an important point that has been made by Mises' uh, friend uh, Wilhelm Röpke, uh, writing in the 1940s. So Röpke uh, had a, a similar background in, in personal experience as, as Mises. Well, he was not Austrian, he was, was German. Uh, but So he lived through the very difficult periods of the, of the 1930s and gave a lot of thought to, to questions of uh, migration, uh, immigration. And, and he came up to this distinction, well, well there, there's something like a, a natural uh, a flow of, of migration and that can be um, uh, impeded, uh, hampered by government intervention in both directions. So governments can, can both prevent that people come together who wish to live together and w- wish to integrate, but they can also impose um, migrants on a host population, uh, which would be just as bad. Um, so Mises uh, did not stress this in his writings of the 19, uh, 1940s, but as you have said, he eventually um, uh, uh, came around 
uh, to uh, endorse this point to, to some extent when he says, well, we need to be careful whom we let into the country because, of course, the liberty that we enjoy depends on the fact that people uh, well, actively suppose, uh, uh, support a constitution of liberty uh, so that they uh, support uh, uh, the government of, of a free country and that they support free enterprise and so on. So if we let uh, Nazis into the countries and Bolsheviks and so on uh, en masse, then, of course, we run the danger that these people might influence the uh, the turn of elections, so the wrong uh, governments get to power and so on. Well, Rothbard wrote about immigration and man economy and state. He viewed it at that stage in his writing as a just a, a form of government intervention that was designed to artificially keep wages high for the inhabitants right. of a particular region. Mm-hmm. Later on, he wrote this fantastic article, From My Perspective, Nations by Consent, and he seems to have changed and morphed a little bit, and he talks about how the f- collapse of the former USSR affected his view, and he starts talking about nations versus states. So could you elaborate a little bit on, on Rothbard on immigration? Well, I, m- I must say, I, I read the, the essay uh, about the time when it appeared. Uh, it was one of the, those writings, I think, that it appeared po- posthumously. But I didn't study it uh, again, so I could not uh, comment in, now in detail on it. What I uh, remember is indeed a change of mind, which was uh, remarkable, but which is finally, uh, Rothbard rallied himself, that is how I experienced it uh, at the time, he rallied himself to the uh, Rupkian uh, position, right? So that there is, right, government intervention can, can uh, uh, operate in both ways, right? So it can uh, prevent people uh, from, uh, from coming together, but it can also Im- impose uh, visitors that you uh, do not really like. And so just as we would, um, uh, I mean, not let everybody into our living room or into the, our, uh, our property, uh, so it's natural also that you have this, the same reflex um, uh, as far as the nation is concerned, right? The nation, as opposed to the state, is, uh, well, uh, the, uh, so the, the uh, organic um, uh, a community of people who share uh, a common political project. I mean, that, that's how it is uh, typically defined in modern terms. Or uh, the old Germanic uh, uh, definition was, well, you have uh, uh, common ancestry, right? So you belong to the same tribe, so to say, in the nation is uh, some sort of, of a big family of, of tribes that share this, this common past and therefore are uh, imbued with the uh, same values and so on. Now, um, uh, the nation uh, understood in this way is independent of the state, right? You you can uh, have uh, a political community without a common organization, right? So you can very well have a, have a nation without a government, uh, at least a, a modern state uh, as, as we know it. You can have a nation in the Germanic sense without any uh, politi- particular political project that is being uh, shared by everybody or without a, gov- a common government, uh, right? So the, the nation then in a, uh, in a free society or in a, in a free setting, Right, where there's no uh, uh, intervention by by force, so no violation of property rights. A nation is uh, an organic uh, a body that uh, dev- uh, uh, develops or evolves uh, spontaneously. Right, so it's, it's not something monolithic that that stays the same as no no let's say ethnic or, uh, ethnic purity or something that that is preserved or political purity that re- remains the same throughout the, the course of the time. But it changes under the impact of millions of uh, individual decisions right so and so it's uh, the changes that occur are bottom up uh, they, they start in uh, individual decision making or in uh, choices that are made within families and so on and then ultimately come to be reflected in uh, the the outer appearance of this community that we call nation and this of course changes as soon as we have government interventions which might concern the, the composition of the nation which might uh, uh, seek to um, uh, give uh, it a, p- a particular political project right? this is a big idea in, in French politics the idea that politics should create a, a common project for all uh, members of of the nation, right? And in that case, of course, uh, well, the uh, development is no longer organic, uh, but uh, it's, uh, well, you get the typical uh, uh, consequence that results from government uh, intervention. Do you think modern libertarians make a mistake in the sense that they seem to be hostile to concepts of organic nationalism and, and even family and culture? Yeah, I think uh, definitely there is some such uh, tendency uh, among libertarians as uh, well as in the general uh, uh, population. Yesterday uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the subject, and I told you that I was surprised 
how uh, strongly public opinion ch seems to have changed on these uh, questions in, in Germany, right? Because you have a population that is not particularly libertarian in, in most respects, right? But then on this question of, of migration, suddenly everybody seemed to rally to the uh, position that it's a very bad thing if the government prevents people from coming, right? which is a very, is, is, is a, is a very strong uh, libertarian uh, positioning in, in many ways. Uh, so it's, it's kind of uh, surprising. So it's not surprising then that libertarians in their terms Right, who are after all also part of society would be also imbued with the, with the same ideas. Now, uh, certainly, uh, f f uh, again, we have to remind ourselves as, as libertarians, uh, uh, libertarian doesn't doesn't mean uh, libertinism. It doesn't mean uh, uh, anything goes right. The liberty that we enjoy, uh, the political liberty that we enjoy, is based on private property. And, um, and so our liberty extends only to the limits of our own property. So uh, that, of course, has implications also for the flow of migration. So you, you, I mean, there is no such right just to go to any place you like, right? Nobody has the right to just pop up in my living room and, and, and claim that he is un, uh, uh, unjustly prevented by my, uh, uh, my, my door or something or by the walls of, of my house and so on. And, and for the same reason, I think um, uh, there is no such a right um, as, as a categorical right that you go to any place, to any other uh, foreign nation or other foreign country. There's, there's no such right. right? You have the right to, to, to the extent that you have the consent of the property owners, the people who help you to, to go there. You have a, an airfare carrier and so on, so you make a contract with them. Uh, you uh, have contractual relationships with people who are running the streets in this and that uh, country, the people who are uh, owning houses where you can rent a space or buy a space and so on. To the extent y that uh, you get this consent from uh, existing owners, yes, you can do this. Uh, but if you don't have this consent, well, of course, then uh, you are just an intruder, uh, by, uh, plain and simple. Now, the problem that we have is, of course, public ownership. Right? We have public ownership of uh, uh, airports, public ownership of, of streets, and, and so on. And uh, so here we create a, a political problem. Now, um, Uh, and, and this, of course, is, is the heart of, uh, of the question. Now, I think from a libertarian point of view, that we cannot just uh, jump to the conclusion that uh, government should prevent nobody to use public space in this and that uh, way. And, of course, that would be utterly impracticable. Right? I mean, for example, we have a public library. We cannot say, well, the, the government should impose no rules on how the books should be used. This is silly, right? just because it's, it's a public pop uh, property. You cannot do anything that you wish on, on the street. Uh, so why should you be, be, be free unconditionally uh, without any limitations just to use the street? Right? So it, it's not, so my point is, it's, it's not, it doesn't go per se that this is the libertarian position that uh, of, of anything goes as far as uh, public uh, property is concerned. Well, Hoppe talks about this. He says that so-called public space really ought to be seen as owned by taxpayers yeah. and taxpayer preferences. Yeah, actually, this is a much stronger, uh, uh, it's, it's much more, more, more sensible, right? And I, I think it's more conform to common sense to make right. this kind of claim. Let me ask you about his point that there's a difference between goods and people in the sense that imported goods have been ordered uh, by a, a factory or something in the U.S. and will, will eventually be paid for, whereas there are sometimes to wholly uninvited immigrants into a country. So do you think that's a legitimate distinction? Yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, I mean, Im Im uh, immigrants may be welcome, right? Again, to the extent because when when they come to a country, it's it's not that you have just barren land that is owned by nobody. I mean, in the U.S., you, you still have uh, large chunks of land that are not used by anybody. Actually, they are owned all by the federal government, as I, as I understand, to some extent by, by by state governments. Okay, this is, this is a separate issue. But usually, if you come to a place that is civilized. Uh, well, where people would like to go because they don't want to go into the desert in Nevada and so on, into the Rocky Mountains. They go to places where there are people uh, and so on. Well, all of this already owned by somebody, right? And uh, so we have public uh, uh, space, well, run by uh, politicians that are elected by, finally, well, by, by taxpayers and are responsible to the citizens who elect them and they have to finance all these projects. So I think, yes, if, if you just come, you, you, uh, you don't have a right just to show up and expect that you should be hosted. This is uh, contrary to common sense. I, I, you don't even, even need to be libertarian to, to come to this conclusion. Well, one final question. Undoubtedly, we're a long way from a hoppy and private property type order. We're going to have public property, quote unquote, right. for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. So given that reality, what would, what would you say as a practical matter ought to be a libertarian perspective to, let's say, uh, immigrant criminality or immigrant abuse of welfare systems in Germany? 
Well, I mean, as a practice, the most important things that, that we should stress uh, from a libertarian point of view is that it's uh, uh, it's not the libertarian position that public space should be used as anything goes. Right. So, but so it's fully a consonant with the libertarian position that the government. If it tries to represent the the feelings and the uh, the uh, objectives of the of the uh, population uh, that has elected it, well, then it should uh, uh, pursue policies that uh, c- control to some extent the, the the flow of these people. You don't let just anybody in. And by the way, this is already a current practice in in uh, countries that have uh, in most countries that have immigration policies, rational Im- immigration policies, such as Canada, such as uh, Australia, such as New Zealand. So even for f- uh, for the U.S., this is a, a fairly recent uh, thing that uh, you just open the doors and, uh, and, and there are people uh, are cheering and saying, well, the door should be open for, for everybody and so on. Um, uh, certainly from a libertarian point of view, this is not a good policy. Um, and then finally, I should maybe also uh, add a, another consideration. Of course, this policy, uh, clearly as far as labor markets is, uh, is concerned, is has, uh, at least in the short and in the medium run, negative repercussions on those who are already there. Right? I mean, the, uh, the level of uh, revenues, of real revenues, well, depends on the amount of capital that is, uh, is available. The amount of capital does not increase with the kind of immigration that we get from Latin America, from Africa, and from other countries. So necessarily, then, the remuneration is uh, diluted for those who are already there. And so this creates a, a short-run interest. Now, the only uh, um, institution or, or group of people who benefits from this as a whole are, of course, uh, politicians and also, to some extent, people in the financial industries. Right? Because what you get, of course, if, you have, if the population increases, you uh, uh, have more uh, uh, factors of production. So as a consequence, GDP tends to increase. Right. Overall GDP tends to increase, not GDP per capita, which is precisely the bottom uh, experience of the people uh, at the base. Right. But of course, for the government, this is very important to have an increase of GDP because this means higher tax revenue. For the banks, it's, it's important uh, that uh, GDP uh, increases because this uh, uh, permits a, an extension of the credit economy. So we have to look at this uh, f- uh, uh, also by taking these these points into a consideration and not ending up being just the puppets, the useful puppets of the usual interested parties. Dr. Holtzman, we thank you for your time. We'll be very interested in your, in your next report from Germany. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.